praise the Lord. We are, well, we are, we are concluding our short series on the book of Galatians. I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing this Sunday, either the book of Ephesians. I'm thinking of continuing the prison epistles, which will be Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. But because this Sunday is uh, Father's Day, I, I don't think I have thought in a while about, about fathers. So. Um, maybe I'll, I'll teach the whole Sunday on, on Father's Day, okay, about fathers. But... In our study in Galatians, the main theme is Christian freedom. That freedom is only going to be realized when you walk in the Spirit. Because, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Okay? So, the more a person <clears throat> is walking full of the Spirit, the more free he is or she is. And how do you know that you are a free, a free person because you have the liberty and the ease of executing the will of God. Now, if you know what is right and you are not doing it, then you're a slave to sin. If you know what is wrong and you are doing it, the more it shows you're a slave to sin. We're talking about Romans chapter 6 here. And so in Galatians, the uh, Galatian questions have been pulled in so many directions by all kinds of parties and uh, belief system that is enslaving them back. Now, Paul rebuked them. And so uh, the topic of this conclusion is moving on from here. And really the goal of Galatians is get back in the spirit. Okay, get back in the spirit. And from the sub subject of chapter 5, fruit of the Spirit and works of the flesh, those are, those are, if I am Paul and this is Galatia, I, this is how I'm going to teach it. You want to know who among you are walking in the Spirit. Look at their fruit. Is there goodness? Is there kindness? Is there long-suffering? Is there temperance? Is there love? Is there faith? If all of these are present, then those people operating on these are walking in the Spirit. How do you know among us who are those who are working the works of the flesh, who are immorals, who are uh, thieves, who are disrespectful to parents and all of those things. Those are the works of the flesh. The books of the Bible are really very practical. The theologians just simply made it like it's something that is out of this world. But it is something that you can get a hold of and live on. So, how do we continue from there? Let's read again our main text. Galatians 6, starting on verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you, are, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourself so that you also won't be tempted. We concentrated on those two, one verse actually this morning. Okay, that's, that's what we basically discussed. Verse 2, carry one another's burdens, in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. But if anyone considers himself to be something when he, has, when he is nothing, he deceives himself, he, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. This the context here of comparing yourself one with another are the parties. Okay, the, uh, the circumcision party, the Greek philosopher's party, the uh, do whatever you want party. They are comparing who's got more members, who's got more disciples, who's got more followers, who's got more money. They are always comparing. And this is how, what, what Paul was uh, talking about. Let the one who is taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For what, whatever a person sows, he will also reap, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Now that last verse, 
if we are working the works of the Spirit, it will be examined, because Paul is say, saying, examine yourself. Okay, but if you're doing good, feel, feel proud, but alone. But alone. Now, how do you test then if what you are doing for the body of Christ is of the Spirit? Because really today, you ask people, are you walking in the Spirit? Yes, I speak in tongues. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. You know, even a donkey can speak in other tongues. He spoke human language. What we are talking about here are the fruit. So how do you test? Because again, people keep saying, well, the Lord said this, the Lord said that, and then nothing happens. And it is very easy. The gift of uh, prophesying is one of the most misused you cannot misuse it if it's, it's really of the Spirit. But uh, one of the most pretentious manifestations being done today. Okay, I think that's, that's more like it. People pretending to be prophesying when they are just talking out of their emotions. Now, how do you test it? Look at the last verse. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. You know you are doing the work of the Spirit if the end result is for the good of all. That is the household of faith. And so, if you think you are full of the Spirit, you ask yourself this question. When was the last time that you can identify a work you did that brought good to the local body? If you cannot answer that, you have not done the work of the Spirit. Okay? Plain and simple. You have not done the work of the Spirit. Because even in Ephesians chapter 4, if we go to the prison epistle, I've explained that in context. Even in Ephesians chapter 4, how you test ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, if they are doing good for the community. What is that doing good? If it is building up. How do you know it's building up? When the body begins to find their place and begin to function according to their own gifts. If the leadership is not allowing you to nurture and cultivate your giftings, it's not led by the Spirit. This is all, all very practical, really. And so Paul is uh, removing us from the mystical world of uh, Spiritism in the first century and the practical world of living in the Spirit to those who are of the household of faith, because faith without works is dead. And so, we, we talk about not being overtaken by sin or, or by wrongdoing and all of those things. So, the first thing, how do we move on from here is, those who are overtaken in any wrongdoing, they need to be restored. What's the second thing? Carry one another's burden, Okay. I touched this a little bit this morning, but carry one another's burden. This is how you fulfill the law of love. Now, when you are carrying one another's burden, you are not supposed to think because you are helping somebody, you are better. Okay. Say you are a great swimmer, maybe an Olympian, um, and so you are among the elite. And so obviously you're a great uh, swimmer. And there was a storm and I happened to be in a boat. And you were swimming that day, trying to cross, uh, how do you call the thing? Michigan Lake, you know? Lake Michigan. <laughs> Michigan Lake. Now you're an Olympian. You can cross the length of that uh, lake. I cannot cross 120th of that lake. But I'm in a boat. And there was a storm while you were swimming. And so you find yourself drowning. Okay? I saved you because I'm in a boat. Now, not because I saved you means I'm a better swimmer. You, you see this? Not because I saved you, mean, that's it. it doesn't mean I'm a better swimmer. I may have jumped in the water to reach you because I have no rope to drag you in the boat. I did that. But simply because I have never swam. By the amount of time, same amount of time that you have swum. And so you're dead tired, I'm fresh. By that surge of strength that I have, I'm able to pull you out. I cannot brag and say, ha ha, you're an Olympian, I'm a better swimmer. That will be wrong. Because what if the Olympian says, really? 
jump, let's cross the Michigan Lake. You will be the one now needing to be saved. And He may not save you. Okay? So not because you help somebody means you are better than that person. You have, from that illustration, you should see it. It doesn't mean you are better than that person. It just simply means you are placed in a position to be able to help. And so, when you have the ability to help somebody, it should not make your head grow big. Okay? It should humble you, in fact, that at a critical moment, God find you available so that He can use you to fulfill His purpose. That's just how it is. And that's what you mean by carry one another's burden. Okay? Third, or uh, next, yeah. Examine your own work. And this is where we really pick up. Examine your own work. What you have done yourself, not what others have done. Look at this. Examine your own work. It didn't say examine the work of others. Now, I'm not talking here about employee-employee relationship because, of course, in a setting like that, there is such a thing as accountability, whether you are doing your duties or not, your obligations or not. So we're just talking about the work of the ministry. Examine your own work. Do you have a ministry? Examine it. Okay, examine it. What you have done. If you like what you did, take pride alone, privately. Okay? So, so for example, you, you did something that, that is really beneficial to the body of Christ. Privately, you thank God. You rejoice in the presence of the Lord. And you say, Lord, thank you for using. But don't go on YouTube and, and, and do a one-hour documentary on how well you did. Okay? Privately, alone. Okay? Alone, privately. I was uh, in great need in Virginia Beach when uh, I was a student. And, you know, I, I share among students. I have a friend who is a... Uh, an investor. And one day, he made in one day, listen to this, $45,000. <laughs> he made, he's an investor. He was into some big business before, and, and so he was supporting himself by, by uh, trading in the stock market. One, one day he came to school and said, Jose, I am so blessed. I said, why? He said, what I need for the whole year. I earned this week. I said, what do you mean? He said, I made $45,000. I said, wow, you know. And so the, the, the three of us, our friends, were sharing, were having lunch. And he said this. He said, oh, by the way, Jose, I know your needs. I have transferred money to your account in, in front of my other friend. I was, I was taken aback because, you know, when, when, you, when you have a need, you don't want people to publicize helping you. Because it's, it's embarrassing. Yeah. So he said, well, having lunch. I have transferred money to your account. And so I, uh, I have blessed you. I could not say anything except thank you. But the other friend, he's a Southern Baptist, picked on the, our conversation and says, my friend, if you're going to help Jose, shut up. He said, he said, I am here listening to you say that. You embarrass him. Because he saw I was embarrassed. He said, keep it to yourself. If you need to, to help him, you tell him in private so he knows there's money. And all of this is for $100. He transferred $100 in my account at Regent University. When I heard that you embarrassed me in public for $100, I'll give you $100. That's what I was thinking, you know. But that is what I mean. You need to learn how to rejoice privately when God uses you. Don't, don't immediately look for a testimony time so you can announce to everybody how you give $50 to somebody. Uh, don't do that. You will lose your reward. People will, will compliment you in public and you will lose your reward before the Lord. Now, that is an important teaching because of the following points that Paul made in this letter. Okay? Do not compare yourself also with someone else, meaning do not think of yourself to be better or higher than the other guy. The, the way, don't say, I am better than him. Because you don't know that. Okay? I am better than him is a language of, whose language is that? 
What? No, I am better than him. Whose language is that? Don't think deep, okay? Children. We are talking. We're talking about maturity, maturity. It's the language of children. Have you noticed when children are doing something, you teach them how to use the hammer, suddenly they are better than you. Suddenly there's, you give them the costume of uh, Iron Man. Suddenly they are wearing it all over the house and they're stronger than their father because they are now Iron Man. This is, a, this, you, you don't take it seriously. This is the children of, uh, the language of children. But when you are an adult, you keep it yourself. You know who's the richest man on earth right now? Anybody knows? Nobody knows. It's not Bill Gates. It's not Warren Buffett. You know who it is? We don't know. Because if he's truly the richest, he won't let anybody know. <laughs> Why in the world will you let somebody know? The politicians will be knocking on your door every hour. Everybody will be asking for your help. You see? So they keep it quiet. The richest people on earth, you don't know. But if you begin to read up, you will notice some of these people, they own islands. You know, they own mountains. I was making some reading on this one. I said, my goodness, these people are super rich. And they are barely talking. They are the real rich. And rich, not just in stock market, okay? They own islands. They own mountains. They own lakes. These are the people who really own things. And uh, they, are, they are uber rich, you know. And, and it's an amazing thing. And so you keep it to yourself. Be happy in the Lord that, that He is using you. Ultimately, you carry your own load. Everybody will carry their own burden. If you're thinking right, you will help others carry their own burden. But it is their burden. DJ comes and say. Now, it, it doesn't happen, of course, because she lives in a different world than me. So, well, you're trying, you're trying your best to be a doctor, you know. I'm not. Uh, you are a doctor. Not medicine, okay? So, if she speaks her language, I don't understand this. Now, if she says, I have a project and Papa, you can help me. I can point her to it. But that's her burden. And by the way, this is the basic mistake of parents. They do the homework of their kids. You don't help them carry their own burden. You unburden them. Now remember that burden is important for them to grow. You take away that pressure from them, they will never grow. So I should point her to solutions and procedures. I should point her on how to be responsible. I should... I should point her into being this and that. By doing that, I am helping her carry her own burden, but each to her own load. Okay? I have a family. Five kids to, to feed these five kids. They, I mean, when they eat, it's monstrous, you know? They, they just don't stop. This COVID pandemic, every night... I'm hearing something baking and cooking from this, these three promoters, John, DJ, and James. Uh, yeah, they, they just, they can't do anything except cook and eat. Yeah. Now, if, for example, they want to eat and say, Papa, I'm hungry, Mama, I'm hungry, and I always say, I'll go down and cook. I am not helping them carry their burden. You want to eat? You cook. I'm, by the way, I'm the, me, only me and Joel are special in the house. We are the only ones who do not cook. But all of them cooks. Okay? But by doing that, allowing them to explore, I am actually helping them prepare for their future. That's so why Joseph now cooks. You know? And he's a, he cooks like his mom. Because his mom, when, he, when she cooks, he cooks for two weeks. Just uh, reheat and reheat. Well, Joseph, forget he is single. So one time she, he cooked lasagna. I think he, he bought he six pounds of, of, I said, six pounds of ground beef. He said, oh, Papa, I didn't realize how many it is. You know? 
So he, he cooked uh, six pounds. And so he made lasagna, he made all kinds of pasta. And he said after a couple of weeks, oh, finally, Papa, it's over. But he did not throw it. Where did, she le where did he learn it from? He learned it from his mom. By the way, when his mom, when, when he is with his mom, he used to be angry with, with, with Mama. Why, why do you keep the food, uh, food in the refrigerator? Now he's keeping the food in his wrap. Why? Because now he's spending his own money. Therefore, he grew legs. He knows how to carry his own burden. You see, you, you will know if you have been prepared well when you are alone. When you cannot carry your own burden, you are ill-equipped. Okay? You, you are ill-equipped. When I came to America, I never called my parents, I need some help. My, my wife called her, her dad, but I never called my parents. I never asked for help. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm pretty sure my, my father would do his, his best to help. I never did. I carry my own load. And I, I assured my, my, my father in the airport, I said, Tatai, you, you helped me, you raised me, you prepared me, you taught me hard work and some values. That's enough, I said. That's enough. I'm, I'm prepared. So I am equipped to do life. And that's how you know, uh, in comparison, whether spiritually you are walking in the Spirit. As a parent, whether you, you are walking in the Spirit. If you are preparing your children, the most spiritual thing that parents can do is to prepare their children to do life. If you cannot prepare your children to do life, that's the most carnal thing that you have ever done in your life. But the moment I have prepared them to do life, wherever they go, they go to church, they volunteer, they serve the Lord, they pay their tithes, they give their offering, they live right. I have prepared them to do right. If they cannot be swayed easily by all kinds of opinion, I have prepared them. But they, if they are easily swayed, the moment they go with the monkeys, they act like a monkey. They are not prepared. The moment they go with the dogs, they act like a dog. They are not prepared. But if they stay human, even though they are with the monkeys and the dogs, then you have prepared them to do life. That is the most spiritual thing that you have done, even if you never spoke in tongues. Okay? And this is, this is the practical application of Christianity. This is how you know you are doing the word of the Lord. This is what you call as fruit of the Spirit. So ultimately, each of us carry our own burden while helping others carry their own burden. Why is it important? Because you are accountable. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Listen, we will be judged according to every work. Whether that work works of the flesh or fruit of the Spirit. That's the judgment. Whether the Holy Spirit is able to reproduce Jesus in you. That's the, that's, that's the ultimate judgment because the earth is being restored by God. Into what? Into the Garden of Eden. That's his project. That's his restoration. And so ultimately, we will all become like Jesus. So learn how to be your own person. Now, now I'll, I'll tell you, this, is, this may not sound spiritual, but this is very spiritual. Especially for the, for the young people, be an excellent contributor to the community. Listen, you see what's going on right now. Do not be like those protesters who are looting and stealing. Be like those people who have worked and paid their taxes, pray for the government, vote properly. Do not be dependent on the government. That's the most spiritual thing you can do. Okay? If you can do that, you live your life depending on God, earning your keeps, then you are spiritual. But if you are uh, dependent on all kinds of things and you're, you're getting old, you have not been prepared well. You, you, need, you, you need to be prepared well, you know? I, I got married with $167. I, I didn't call my kuya, who was already rich during the time. Kuya, can you help me out? I didn't do that. It's none of his business. He's not the one being married. It's me. Yeah. Why? Because I can carry my own weight. I have been prepared spiritually. Yeah. 
It, that if you have, can you imagine this? My wife was raised well by her dad, but she was willing to be married in a, before a judge with me. That, that's spiritual. So, what, what, yeah, she is that spiritual. Because we lack the finances, she is willing to be married with me in front of a judge. Why is she willing to do that? Because she is very spiritual. A carnal person will borrow $100,000 and be heavily in debt just so that you can have a one day of great marriage and 10 years of paying your debt. That's very carnal. Have you heard anything like that before? That's a spiritual lesson. You see, you are making mature decisions. And so when that happened, I, I really admired my wife because she said, I, I'm willing. Yeah, I'm willing. And uh, the Lord provided for us. These are the practical applications of what walking in the Spirit is. Now, let's go deeper. Okay? This, this conclusion now, huh? Galatians. Next. So the first one is if somebody is overtaken by wrongdoing, restores that someone. Okay. Second one is uh, carry one under a burden. Third is examine what you have done. Okay. Now, next. If you are taught in the Word, listen to this. If you are taught in the Word of God, share all good things with the teacher. Now, I'm not talking about tithes. Now, I, I never, I knew this for years. I never demanded any of this. The Lord has, has led me in a different direction. And uh, the Lord has always raised uh, provision for me. Okay? But I'm talking about Christian. I'm not going to be your pastor forever. And you're going to have ministers whom the Lord will raise and be among you. And so, I'm teaching this now for their benefit. Okay? And for the future of this church. When somebody is teaching you the word, you share with that teacher good things. That's in chapter 1, verse 6. Again, that's the words of Paul. The emphasis here is in teaching the word. This is where we find the immediate context of the statement, God is not mocked. For whatever a, a, a person sows, he will also reap. Now, I told you this morning one aspect of that. The teachers or the ministers of the gospel are, are sowing to you the word. You are, they are sowing spiritual things. Now, you sow carnal things. That's what Paul said. Here, there's another different aspect. There are two levels, of, two levels or kinds of sowing involved in the passage. First is the sowing of the word. This is how you identify true ministers. True ministers are not identified as to where they graduated from, okay? Or how big their church is. Or how much their income is. How new their cars are. And how big their houses are. That's not how you judge it. You judge true ministry by how much of the word are they sowing? Sowing equivalent to teaching. When he sows the word of the Lord to the congregation, there is a harvest that can be discerned. Okay? You begin to see people's lives changed. You even begin to see struggle. You'll find people stumbling over truth. And, and rising back up, even that is a fruit. For example, that's why it's not a quest for perfection. You see somebody fall in sin. And because you have sown the word in their heart, they decided, I'm going to rise up, I'm going to need help. And so even the struggle of them rising back up on their feet is a result of the work of the ministry. Okay? So, it's like parents seeing their children make a mistake and their children owning up. I, I told you that I'm, I'm blessed with, with Joel when one day because I was looking for a watch that my wife bought for me and I was blaming James. And one day Joel just simply said, Papa, I am very sorry. I was the one who broke your watch. Can you imagine a little kid have the, have the honesty and the sincerity 
he, he could have incurred my wrath because I have been blaming James because, you know, sometimes I just like blaming James. Uh, it's fun to blame James a lot of times, the way he reacts. So I was just blaming James. And every time I blame James, Papa, I did not do it. Then he will be looking at his room, looking for the watch, and it's not there. <laughs> But, but Joel came forward and says, Papa, I was the one, I am very sorry, I was the one who broke your watch. You know, it blessed me. Why? Because the word is bearing fruit in, his, in that little boy's heart. And that, that, that for me is important. But when your kid keeps lying, the devil is producing himself in your kid. Are you listening? I have my kids lie to me. So I know what I'm talking about. It's not the result of the Spirit. You see? Because that ability to take responsibility, the moment you can see that your congregation taking responsibility over their own actions and decisions, that's maturity. You begin, you begin to see that. That's one part of sowing. A minister's goal is, Paul has two prayers. Uh, number one, for them to be born again, which happened. Number two, that Christ may be formed in them. Remember that? He was, was praying that Christ may, I, I, I cry for you, that Christ may be formed in you. That's the second intercession. That you will be like Christ. Now, the second aspect of sowing is, comes from the students or the recipients of the ministry of the word. They saw off their good things to a teacher. Now, let's, let's review the context. The temple ministry at this point has been corrupted. The Levites were supposed to be the traveling ministers that were supposed to be teaching the word. But the temple has been corrupted. The high priestly office is highly political. Annas and Caiaphas bought their office from, from Pilate, uh, from Herod. You know? They bought it. And they bought it because that's the bribery scam. Corruption. And for them... To pay it off, they entered into some sort of business like money changing. The current, they own the currency, they, they own Western Union in those days. They own currency exchange. They sell, they sell doves and sacrificial animals and overpriced them. And so they own acres of land, especially in northern Galilee. Uh, the town of Magdala, they own largely. And uh, they become very corrupt. So what happened to the tithes and offering that some people were giving? It's being used towards that. Therefore, it's no longer being used towards the Levitical supply. So these Levites were short of funds. So most rabbis, if not all, have extra work. You know, that's why in historical context, I don't find it uh, hard to find meaning in working. From time to time, if I can do that, I still do that uh, today. You know, and extra money for my wife. And uh, the thing is this. That's why the rabbis, the traveling rabbis, are not receiving from the temple. The Levites. So how does a rabbi like Jesus support himself? He is preaching, he is teaching, and, and he has a, a money bag. The treasurer back then was Judas. So when he was still okay. And so after the minister preach, they'll drop off an offering. That offering is not their tithes. It's not their temple tax. It's not their offering. Okay? That is in support. Of the, and so the minister can carry on the work of the ministry. You know? And that's how it, it, it happened. And that's how Jesus got supported. And then the Lord raised some women like Salome... Uh, his mom, Martha, Mary of Magdala, to support him in what he was doing because there are certain women who follow Jesus in his ministry. That's how Jesus was supported. That is still how ministers are being Including our church. There's a large part of, of 
power ties something goes to the uh, uh, mortgage payment and maintenance of the building, which biblically is not supposed to. Be. But that is how we allocate that. Otherwise, we won't have a building, you know. And so now you have the responsibility. That's why this is the ground about which some churches, when they have a guest speaker, they collect extra operating. Okay, for the preacher. Because now, some, some preachers deny this. I, I, my eyes are open, I don't deny this. You have one income. Your responsibility is to be paid with your time. If you have extra, only if you have extra, you can give an offering. If you have no extra, no offering, okay? God will never hold it against you. But your responsibility is tithe. Okay? That is, now I've noticed, for example, and, and this is very consistent in our church, if it's Christmas season, our offering goes down. Why? Because you, you have one income. You decided you want to spend your offering on uh, the gifts to, to your friends. I have no problem with that, but don't touch the tithe because it's not yours. You know? So it happened. Every time I, I, uh, I raise uh, funds for something, you, you can guess. I'll smile and, and, and I'll, I'll tell my wife, uh, watch the swing of the, uh, of the offering. The moment we raise money for something, something is being taken from others. Like if I raise money for this cause, suddenly the building fund will go down. What? Because you have one income. Your money does not expand simply because you gave. I don't know why preachers preach that. I think. No, it, it's the same. <laughs> it's the same paycheck you receive every weekend. That's why preachers have to be very wise in managing these resources. That I understand. That's why you can't abuse that. You see? But then, God will begin to bless people who are faithful. And that is when, if you can bless the ministers ministering to you the word, and that is when churches begin to say, if you have guests, they, they take extra offering. I, I don't have it in my heart to do that. I don't, I, I don't have the release in my spirit, nor do I have the conscience to do that. So I take it to our general funds, you see. Because I understand some people have obligations in the Philippines, etc., etc. But it is a responsibility. You, you, you need to bless those who are ministering to you the word. And again, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm saying this because... I don't know how long I have in this church. Uh, I'm, I'm getting pretty old now, you know. Uh, take care of your next ministers. Okay? If you want the Lord to bless you with good ministers of the word, take care of them. They will sow the word. You need to minister to them carnal things. You say, well, Pastor, say how about you? Listen, my testimony is, since I was 15 years old, the Lord had always raised people to help me in different eras of my life. It's an amazing thing. The first one, I can only remember her last name, Sister Santiago. No read, no write. She can only read the Bible, and she can only sign her name. But the lady bought my first guitar, paid my first tuition fee, and then disappeared. And then I, I can tell you, that's why I, I can relate with Jesus. The Lord raised women. I don't know why women to help her. It's basically have been all women who had uh, helped me through the years. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing thing. And that is how the Lord has always provided well for me. Even, I, I cannot say, say it because they may be watching, but even the blessings I shared to you is from a woman that, that, uh, that I shared to you some time ago. And, and that takes care even with some of my uh, retirement. Yeah. God does that. But as your teacher, I'm telling you right now, the next line of ministers, and whoever ministers to you the word, you need to bless them with uh, your good things, not your bad things. Okay? Not your bad things. Not your leftovers. Not those things. The Lord will certainly bless you for that. I know that when you do that, the Lord will bless you. And that completes the cycle. Why? Because God never wanted any free loaders. Okay? Now, you, you know our policy, and I don't like people taking advantage of this. But years ago, I, I decided that we will take care of our faithful members. So, you know, when... 
When somebody dies, we, we try to help pay some of the obligations. But I always, I always say this, that's for the faithful members of the house. Now, if somebody is dying, you don't make them members of Lion's Heart and say, oh, you're dying, go to Lion's Heart. They'll help you pay for your funeral. No. <laughs> if I have just seen you now and you die, see you wherever, you know. But you are not part of that community that sweat, interceded, bled, and worked hard for this house. <laughs> I mean, it's just fair, you know. Because if I do that, then it becomes a burden. It becomes a burden for the community. And I can't allow that to happen, you see. And this is how you will find in the scriptures, they laid it on the apostles' feet. That's not their tithes again, because they're paying their tithes and temple tax in the temple. They're Jews. But extra of their good things, they laid it on the apostles' feet. And that is how the apostles sustained themselves. They did not compete against the temple. Only after some time, a generation later, that they were totally pushed out of Judaism, that they begin to have their own tithing system. But prior to that, the first Jewish believers, they paid tithes in the temple. They paid temple tax. They used the temple. And what they gave the apostles and the church were their extras. Okay? And so this is, this is, this is covenantal, and this is uh, well taught in the book of Philippians. Notice, you sow good things, not bad things. Some of you will remember when we were in the other church and they blessed this uh, fellow minister of mine with, with a car that every week breaks down. I, I told the board, you think you bless him, you cursed him because she did not pay him enough, but, but every week his car is broken and so he has to bring it to the, uh, to the shop and his weekly allowance isn't even enough to pay for it. Then you make it, you make it difficult for your ministers to minister the word of the Lord. Now, by the way, if your ministers are having difficulty earning their keeps, they will have no time to study the scriptures. Now, some of you may observe the ease by which I study and deliver the word of the Lord. It just looks like it, okay? But uh, my wife will tell you, I spend tons of time reading and and studying, my, uh, my son was even asking me earlier this afternoon how I can, because he, he saw me flipping through a magazine, and he said, Papa, do you even know what, what you are doing? I said, son, I, I understand what I'm reading, you know. It takes, it takes time to develop those skills, uh, what, you're, what you are having. And every time I teach you like this, you, you have to understand I have dug deeper. I'm just giving you conclusions for food. But in the process, I have learned a lot more than what I'm, than what I'm, than what I'm sharing. It takes time to do that. It takes resources to do that. My, my, my library is, I love my library. Um, and so these are the things that the minister should be investing in. If you don't give them the abilities, and again, I'm not, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about your future ministers. If you don't do this to them, you will end up not having good teachers of the Word of God. So, in, 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 a, in application, God is not mad. Some have used the church as centers to take advantage of others. To use you as contacts for their business. Don't do that. You know. Listen, in the scriptures, especially in Leviticus, there is this command, make a distinction between what is holy and what is profane. What is clean and what is unclean. Now I encourage you guys to, to have your own business. And if you can use each other as business contacts and partners, praise God. That's how it is supposed to be. But when we come for worship, <laughs> when we come to study the Word of God, let's do that. Don't come, hindi na ba may utang sa akin? Don't do that. Then your heart will not be focused on worshiping and serving the Lord. You have to have the maturity to separate that. Now, 
in this house, you are each other's built-in contacts. Don't deny that. Okay, if you are a contractor building a house, I mean, if a member of the church wants to build a house, why get another contractor? But don't give that brother Christian price. Christian price is scary. You know, they are top price and low quality. So, so no, don't do that. Be fair. You know, be fair to your brother and sister in charging them. But separate the church from it. You know, separate the church from it. You are selling a product, sell it outside of the church. Sell it. Make money. But don't pretend that your product is made in the U.S. if it's actually made in China. Okay? Don't say it's made out of diamond when it's made out of clay. And don't lie. Don't, don't be a worldly salesperson. Oh, this product will make you beautiful. Don't lie like that. Okay? Sell it properly. This product will cover your ugliness. That will be better. You know? <laughs> that will be more appropriate. But don't say it will make you more... Because then you become a liar. You become like the world. But you are each other's contact. And I believe you should support each other. You know, if you, I even encourage if you need some help, uh, get, get somebody from the church who, need, who, who, who may need some extra hand, extra help, so they can earn extra, extra money, you know. And, and, and do that like, like, like that. But separate the church. You have to separate the church. Because if you don't, then you become like the high priests of the first century. Just milking the people. So don't invite, hey, come to our church. I know you are selling this. We have a lot of people in the church who can buy your product. Don't do that. That will be wrong. Okay? Because now you are merchandising the anointing. Now, if he is a, she is a member of the church and she has this skill and you need that skill, then by all means, hire her. But it should not prevent him from interviewing other contractors so that he will know whether she is fair or not. You know, when, when I was making the house, I, I, had a, I had a neighbor who's an electrician, a licensed electrician, and I asked him to submit a code for my electrical needs. Boy, the guy submitted a code that is four times more expensive than the others. And so I did not enter. He got so upset. He badmouthed me in the neighborhood. And my neighbor said, was pleading with me, please, Reduce the price and, and, and take him as your contractor. I said, I can't reduce the price. I said, he's four times more expensive. How, how are you going to reduce the price? He's charging $1 and the other contractors are charging 25 cents. I said, I can't possibly tell him, you want $1, I'll give you 25 cents. Bastos lang tawag doon sa Pilipino. So I said, I can't entertain him. Boy, the guy, the guy got really upset. We're doing construction and he will be snooping inside our house. But I did the right thing for my family. I did not hire him. Now, you, you Christians, some people say you're victimized. No, you're not victimized. You victimize yourself. You already know that it's not a good price and you still bite it. You will pay for it. You will carry your own mistake. Okay? Be wise in using the resources that God gave you because there is a purpose for it. Do not take advantage of one another. Okay? Be careful also in recommending your minister's friend. Some of you already know that you cannot do it to me. But not everybody is as brazen as me saying no. Some pastors, this is their deacon, and he has a friend who is a pastor. Pastor, can you have him preach? And that pastor feel like I have no choice but to have him preach. Well, me, I have a choice. If I don't like you to preach, you don't preach. Okay? Stop easily recommending ministers, especially those of you who know some. Stop doing that because that takes away some resources of the church. That's why for some ministers watching, do not be quick in inviting others because your people have one income and you need to learn how to manage the resources of the house. Also, if you want to be blessed, make sure you are teaching the word of the Lord. In my experience, when you teach the word of the Lord, God is faithful. He always raises people to supplement your needs. I have always had that in the last 40 years plus. I, ha I have some people wanting to sponsor my education. Yeah. When I was 
studying sp speed reading, somebody wants to pay for it. A millionaire in her church. And she told me, Pastor, said, I will take from my tithes, anyway, our church is rich, to pay for your tuition. I said, no. I said, that, that belongs to the storehouse. Well, God told me to help you. I said, well, it's none of my business. It's really your business. She never helped me. But I went to the school for speed reading anyways. You see, because she is not my provider. Because I have to still teach her to do the right thing. Okay? Also, this is a time for us to examine the ground we are sowing in. You cannot just help any, anybody. In fact, in this context, any minister. The first priority is to help those who are sowing the word of the Lord. We have tons. They come uh, in, in a, a dime a dozen, you know. Ministers who do not teach the word of God. Make sure you invest properly. In fact, as a minister, I have to make sure I'm also sowing on good grounds. I have, I have counseled pastors like this. Well, pastors have been pastoring this church for 10 years and they're not doing this, they're not even paying their salary. I said, hey, it's about time for you to examine. Is that a good ground or a bad ground? If they are not sowing in the work of the ministry, it's a bad ground. I said, you know, the dust off your feet and leave down. That's Bible. That, that means they have not received you. Some of you who are original members of this church, you know what happened after two years of pioneering this church. After two years, I, I met the congregation and I said, listen, I have believed you guys in the last two years. And I, I asked the congregation, do you believe that I'm your pastor? And they said, yes, pastor. Said. Well, I said, that's easier said than that. I said, so I told them I, I have extra work and this is all that I'm receiving. I said, so it's about time for us to make a decision whether you are the ground that I will continue to plant the word or not. I said, I'm not asking you to give extra, but let's, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's follow the biblical example of compensation. And so I had my, my board back then. I gave them uh, this thick of passages on tithes and offering, how to use articles. And I told them, read this. And let's talk about how we should manage the finances. I kid you not, they did not read. Yeah, they're not interested. But, but the congregation found out, and that is when they begin to standardizing my compensation. But I told my wife two years, because if this church did not respond, I'm out. I'm out. Because I am not going to minister to freeloaders. Yeah. Nobody has the right, according to uh, Oswald Smith, to hear the gospel twice if the rest of the world has not heard the gospel once. Meaning, if, if people will be freeloaders, oh, I mean, if your kids stay in your house and they don't want to do household chores and they are old, kick them out. By all means. They're freeloaders. Nobody says by God to be freeloaders. You're, to be, you're supposed to be. I mean, my, my kids work. J James helped me. You know, sometimes he, I think he blames me for not finishing his homework. But, uh, but I won't let him either. But he, the guy helped me. And, and you, you ask him, I scream at him when we're working. James, you can't be that slow when you're working with me. Hurry up! Yes, Papa. You look older than me, James. You know? And he had not slept that night, perhaps, because of his homework. But that is, you become part of the family, you carry your own weight. Amen? I don't care if you disagree, that's a spiritual teaching right there, you know? So in the church also, carry your own weight. You know, if, if you think you are receiving the word of God here, Man, pay your tithes. That's the least you can do. It's not yours anyways. Uh, and then when you have extra, give your offering. That's how we make the work prosper. And by the way, this church has been pretty good at that. You know, we, we have blessed them. <laughs> Hallelujah. I owe more money for my house than this church. Yeah. We have less than 200,000. You know why we have less than 200,000? Some... We have few people here who are regularly giving to building amortization. You know, so uh, the monthly mortgage is like this. I'm paying monthly like this. 
And that's how, a couple of years ago, remember, we still have something like 500,000. Now it's, my wife is computing, we have paid over $3 million on this building. Where in the world did the money come from? From you guys. How come I'm not collecting second offering? It's called management. That's why some pastors who keep collecting offering, they just don't know how to manage their money. There's enough money in every church, I believe. So this is, this is, and then when you become faithful on this one, then God will bless you. Okay? God will bless you. And so don't, 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 like, don't, don't let anybody take advantage of our, of our generosity. This church is generous. But don't let anybody take advantage of it. As for some of you who goes with me on missions, you know how I do my best to even budget our food before I will have people cooking and this it become very complicated. So my wife came up with an idea. Why not find somebody who you can contract it with? 50 pesos per meal. Boy, we found some. And it cut our budget by over, over half. It's an amazing thing, you know, on, on how the Lord is giving wisdom. And then the people who come with me in missions, they, they find ways to bless missions. Some of them with, with vehicles. They allow their vehicles to be used for missions so I don't have to rent a vehicle. You see, the, the amount of savings that, that this church, there were times I, I will be in an apartment and a member of the church sponsors the apartment. That, that, that saves money from, uh, from uh, missions. Uh, Sister Yoli, she has a house. Whenever I'm in the area, I stay in her house. I don't pay her. I sleep in her house. I eat her food. And I don't pay her. Well, because God is blessing her. I do the same thing with Brother Willie. When I'm in the area, I, I, uh, I stay with Brother Willie and he feeds me. I don't pay him also. That's, that's how we begin to save these things. And, of course, my wife canvas for the best uh, places where we can possibly stay. And in all of this, we never collect a second offering. Can you imagine if I do? We'll have two buildings. Do you want me to collect second offerings? No, I won't. You know why? Because you are wise. You will split your offering. (laughs) 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 Wise to wise. So why waste time doing that, you know? Okay. This is actually now the focus of sowing and reaping. The context is ministry. There is a teacher. There is a minister. There is a congregation. This is the context of sowing and reaping. Okay? This is the strict context. Now, it doesn't mean you can bless others. That's part of it. But you're talking about the strict context. This is the strict context. Not on anything else. Okay? Let's go to verse 11, okay? Let's see if we can wrap this up. Look at what large letters I use as I wrote to you in my own handwriting. He said this because in other letters, Paul used secretaries. This time, he did not. Those who want to make a good impression in the flesh are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised. But only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves. And yet, they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. May peace come to all who, those who follow this standard and mercy even to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble because I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The end. Oh, but I'll explain. Okay, I'll explain. And, and by the way, what I'm sharing to you, 
the amazing thing, and it's biblical, God can use unbelievers to bless you also. Yeah. Joseph was blessed by unbelievers. Yeah. The spies were hidden by unbelievers. I used to pray this. Lord, use even the vilest offender to bless me. When I was, when I was really in need, oh God, please. Because it, it has happened. You know, it has happened. Be, uh, I, I, like, I like the story of Pastor, the one in Biscaya, who's, who's the pastor? Mm-hmm. Guerrero. Pastor Guerrero, okay. He was telling me a story that uh, I think the first time he came to America was going to Texas. So he took a taxi. He said, Mike, you know, I, I didn't, you know, you know, in Texas, if you get lost, Texas is big. I have gotten lost in Texas, and I spent one tank of uh, gasoline getting lost. Brother really say, oh, that's the silo. It turned out there are 10 silos like that. So, so we didn't realize we were looking at different silos. We, we were just lost. I was driving for hours. Uh, why did I tell the story? Um, using the most vile offender to bless you. Yeah. And Pastor Guerrero said, he, he rented a taxi and he said, it took almost all of my money. He said, I have no more money. Instead, I've got to go to another state. So, so he went, because he said, when the taxi, he said, taxi, bring me to the hotel. He said, my goodness, the taxi is so much money. I think he spent something like $100 or something. Uh, if he can only run, he will run. You know? uh, he realized it was very expensive because Texas is big. So he said, he doesn't know how to leave Texas now. He doesn't have the money. Yeah. So he said, he went to the airport and uh, said, I would like to go to, I think, say Illinois. I would like to go to Illinois. And the lady said, well, this, how much? He said, oh, man, I have no money. He said, how am I going to leave Texas? The, the lady seems to know his distress. And said, sir, what are you doing? Oh, I'm a, I'm a missionary. He said, where are you going? So he, he told her the different states that he will be, leaving, uh, he'll, he'll be using. And you know what that lady did? He doesn't know the lady. The lady used her rewards to purchase his tickets. He walked away from that with tickets for all the states he'll be visiting. The lady who doesn't know him used his reward points to buy him his ticket. That's how God provides. Amen. I mean, we have, we have, we have proven this. And so the Lord will certainly provide for you. Believe me, I'm, 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 a, I'm a living witness of that. The Lord, you serve him, the Lord will provide for you. And it's an amazing sight to see. His conclusion brings us back to the argument and cause of offense in Galatia. He disclosed some of the motives why they are pushing circumcision. They want to make you a testimony. You know how so many people are, oh, I, I help this person, I help this person. It's part of their newsletter so that they can raise more money. Uh, we caught some evangelists in our church coming to our church in the Philippines taking pictures. That's why we forbade cameras in our church back then. Because my pastor was reading one newsletter sell, selling, uh, uh, raising funds and he was looking at the newsletter because he's also trying to raise money from him. And he looked at the meeting. Wow, a lot of people. He said, whoa, you have a big congregation. And said, yes. And then he looked closer. He said, these are my members. It turned out it's a picture from our church. Yeah. This missionary was taking pictures and saying this is his congregation. So from then on, we forbade anybody just pro- taking pictures. Not, not this church. Uh, maybe I should be there also. You know? Maybe they say this is their church or something like that. But this, this, all these lies happen in, in, in ministry. So you don't allow people to take advantage of you. Be wise. You know, be wise. Somebody borrow money from you and they will borrow money again, ask them first, did you pay the other one? 
If they can't pay the other one, then you ask them, why are you borrowing again? You know? Listen, even if it's brother and sister. Because the moment you get old, I mean, you have to live your own life. Are you following me? Or you don't want to follow me? <laughs> this, is, this is how you take care of the resources that God gave you. For example, if I'm serving God and she, and, and she is my brother, and, and uh, I said brother, okay, and she is my brother, it was pretend, and she is serving the devil, why in the world will I bankroll him? Because God is blessing me to make sure that I live a godly life and I serve him, why will I bankroll the devil's minister? Yeah, so. Those are some of the practical things. And some, because of the Asian mentality, we can have to free ourselves from this. But, but we really have to think through this because not everybody in the household serves God. <clears throat> why is it that some people want to please others? when they are just being used to avoid being persecuted. And now we know why some Christians got circumcised, some Gentiles, because the circumcision party is persecuting them. We see the same thing. That's why some Christians are agreeing with deviant lifestyles because they don't want to be persecuted. I know how many times my wife have warned me ever since we did live streaming. Sweetheart, be careful what you say. I said, what do you mean? If you say that homosexuality is sin, some people may go after you. What am I going to do? Lie? Am I going to tell you that it's okay? Then I stop being a minister. Now, so sometimes I'll be very strong in live streaming, and my wife will say, do you know what you just said in the sermon? I said, I do. You'll make other people angry. I said, I always do, anyways. <laughs> you know. Otherwise, I will no longer become a minister of the gospel. Then I must as well quit. And it is your responsibility to make sure that I teach the word of God. But then, persecution is an oppressive thing. Some of you, your friends will say, you're no longer friends, you're a snob if you don't do this with us. So you give in. That's Pressure, that's persecution. That's why I, 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 I tell my kids, when you go and you have to live somewhere else, I tell them this. Even if nobody stands with you, you will stand alone in your faith. Because God is surely standing with you. Maybe that's why Joseph calls the house. I mean, the guy is lonely. If he's watching right now, you are lonely, you know. <laughs> The guy calls the house, I think, 10 times a day or something. I'll be, I'll be going upstairs. He's, we're talking, going down. We're having lunch with him. And, and the, the phone is just there. But I thank God because he's not thinking of going to nightclubs where he can get COVID, you know. Uh, and <laughs> he's not thinking of doing this and that. He, he still uh, maintains a godly lifestyle. And, and, and I tell them, even if you are alone, even if nobody stands with you, stand with the word. That's the kind of Christians that we should be. And these people gave in. That's why some of them got circumcised. They don't want pressure from the Pharisees. They don't want persecution from the circumcision party. You need to be able to stand alone with God. Uh, you think... Just think about this. You think if all of you believe that same-sex marriage is okay, you think I will agree with you? You will burn in your seat while I'm teaching? Well, pastor said we're not going to pay our tithes anymore. Listen, the Lord has been sustaining you before I even laid eyes on you. Okay? The Lord has been providing for me even before we got to know each other. And you have been a Christian, most of you, before you got to know me. The, almost, the common factor that we have is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let's keep it that way. We come here to study the Word, not magic book. We did not come here to study CNN or Aladdin, okay? Or Les Miserables or something like that. 
Did you hear that, DJ? We come here to study the Word of God. And that's our common function. And understand this when I'm teaching and something, sometimes it hurts. Don't even assume that it's only hurting you. It hurt me first. Why? Because I studied it first. And I dug deeper than what I'm sharing. But we have to be faithful in extracting the juice of the Word of God. You have to understand that false ministers are those whose interest is to boast about you that they are able to compel you to do their bidding. Okay? Uh, some of the members who left this church, one former member of this church, uh, he, he began to taunt them. Oh, mga tuta, kayo ni Pastor Jose. And the reason why he said that, he wants them to become his tuta. He wants them to listen to him and he's not teaching the word and he wants them to stop listening to me while I'm teaching the word. That's why it is. If your friends tell you, why do you keep listening to your mom? What they are saying is, stop listening to your mom and start listening to me. Who in the world are they? Where were they when you're growing up? Where were they when you're sick? Nowhere. But then suddenly, this idiot wants you to change loyalty and disrespect your parents for them. And they have not even spent an hour taking care of you. This is the evil that is going on on this earth. You see? And we should never allow that to grow among us. Amen. Thank God this is the conclusion, okay? Paul remained to be steadfast. He is an example to us. In what ways? As we conclude this is the study of this letter, we need to be steadfast in the following things. This is what do we do from now on. Point, point of uh, steadfastness, number one. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. At this point, the cross has been one of the main symbols, if not the main symbol, of Christianity. Aside from Jesus, there are, there are all the numerous Christians under persecution who are also crucified. At this point, so many Christians have been crucified already. Meaning we should resolve it in our hearts that no amount of persecution will stop us from sharing the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our brothers in the first century, when they shared the word, some of them paid it with their lives. Some of you, you're just going to lose a compadre. Lose that compadre. Some of you are just going to lose a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Lose them. Some of these Christians lost their lives. They were crucified. But they remain steadfast to the person of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our loyalty is to Him and Him alone. The rest doesn't even compare. We should identify with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection, even in his sufferings. The first Christians, because it was their time, they know it. The first generation Christians can explain it to them vividly. It's still fresh in their imaginations. They can describe how Jesus was tortured. They, they can describe events in his life when they were trying to kill him and he barely escaped. They can describe their fears in the Mount of Olives, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night Jesus was betrayed. They can describe their fear when they were hiding in the upper room for so many days because they were going after their lives. And then they'll say, but thank God, he who began a good work in us will make sure that it's completed. He filled us with the Holy Spirit and gave us the boldness. That's why the new creation or new birth is what matters the most. You need to make sure you are born again. Peace and mercy come to all those who follow this standard that is the book of Galatians. At the end, Paul told them not to give him any trouble. This is what Paul says, an old man. Don't let anybody give me any trouble for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. 
When Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean like what some of these morons do, have a tattoo of the cross. That's not what it means. Okay? When he said, I bear in my... Let nobody give me trouble, this old man says. I can just imagine he was in prison. He's walking around. The, the a centurion who described him, he's already bald. He's, he's bow-legged, you know. And, and, and he's bent down already because of sufferings. And he said, let nobody give me trouble. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know what those marks are? Scars from being whipped with 39 lashes three times. The beatings he had received. The shackle marks in the jail in, in Philippi. When he was, the first time he went to Macedonia. He said, I have this. He said, I have this. Watch my body. It has been, this has been mangled. All of this. Because I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said, don't let anybody give me trouble. You know Why? Because Jesus is watching over him. Every pain that was inflicted on him by unbelievers and by backsliding Christians, God will hold them accountable. Why? That's the works of the flesh. Do not be mocked. God will make sure you reap what you sow. That's what Paul meant here. Okay. There's a special warning against troubling those who have been troubled by their faith in Jesus. God will never take it lightly. If you are under persecution right now, some of you are watching, and if you think some of your members or some unbelievers and fellow Christians are giving you trouble. God will never take it lightly. If you are doing your best to serve God and others are giving you trouble, God will not be mocked. They are producing the works of the flesh. They will reap what they have sown. This is when it becomes a reality. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Oh, I, can, I can tell you the stories of what happened to Herod. What happened to these people who persecuted Paul? What happened to Nero? My goodness. They reap what they have sown. So stay firm in the faith. Amen. Stand strong. We all make our mistakes. We all rise up. But most importantly in this life, make sure you are full of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Every day ask God, fill you with the Holy Spirit. Sustain up our strength the mighty comforter and teacher of our faith. Amen. Did you learn something from the book? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all stand.